Hello, everyone. My name is Janelle Hazard, and I am the Executive Director at Tefra Institute of Contemporary Art. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We are delighted for tonight's opening reception and artist talk for the exhibition Motherline, featuring work by photographer, filmmaker, video and performance artist Laurel Nakadate. This exhibition is presented in partnership with George Mason University and is guest curated by Lily Siegel and Don Russell. The program tonight is sponsored by Reston Community Center. I see Sherry is joining us. Hi, Sherry, and thank you. Thank you also to the sponsors of TEFRA ICA and Arts Fairfax, um, Virginia Commission for the Arts, and the National Endowment of the Arts. And hello, and thank you to the board members who are here with us tonight. We also want to acknowledge the original stewards of the area known today as Reston in Northern Virginia and the surrounding areas in Washington, D.C. region, which include the Piscataway peoples and the Manahawk peoples, as well as a diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their, their home here today. So this is a very special exhibition. Um, I already mentioned that it's presented in partnership with GMU. And as part of that, a concurrent exhibition titled Mother will be on view at Mason's Exhibition Arlington, beginning on March 25th. And Mother is the third iteration of a group exhibition co-organized by Laurel, which was first shown at Leslie Tonkinau Artworks and Projects in New York in 2018. Mother explores the idea of motherhood from a diversity of female perspectives. So there's a lot to look forward to in this show, um, including upcoming programming at GMU with their Visual Voices series, where Laurel will present a lecture around her work on February 24th and upcoming programs at TEFRA ICA, which includes our creative response series uh, featuring Marina Isgro, the Associate Curator of Media and Performance Art at the Hirshhorn Museum. And she'll discuss the work and the exhibition at TEFRA ICA. And that will take place on February 17th. And so we're honored to host Laurel's work and this exciting, these exciting upcoming programs to look out for. Um, without further ado, I think I will introduce our guest curators. Lily Siegel is the executive director of Hamiltonian Artist in Washington, DC. Before joining Hamiltonian, she was the executive director and curator at Tefra ICA and held curatorial positions at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco, the High Museum in Atlanta, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. She holds a master's degree in modern art history, theory, and criticism from the School of Art Institute of Chicago and a BA in Visual Arts History and Criticism from UC San Diego. Don Russell has been an active contemporary art curator and arts administrator since 1979. His research focuses on the exploration and development of new social contexts for art. And he is currently the university curator at George Mason University, responsible for programming exhibitions and public art on the Fairfax, Manassas and Arlington campuses. He also directs Provisions Research Center for Art and Social Change, providing creative resources for community-engaged public art projects. He is the president of Art Resources International and co-founder, along with Edgar Endress, of Floating Lab Collective. Don previously served as the executive director of Washington Projects for the Arts and had various leadership roles at the Visual Studies Workshop. Please join me in welcoming Don and Lily. Hi everyone. <laughs> Good to see you and to see some familiar faces. And I especially want to say hi to Peter Winant, who was my first partner in crime in organizing this exhibition. Um, Peter and I had the conversations that led to inviting Laurel to work with us. So um, he's part of the reason we're here and very thrilled to be here and introducing Laurel and these programs. I'm going to share my screen to give you a sense of what the exhibition looks like at TEFRA. Except now I have to navigate. Sorry, this never gets easier. <laughs> Hold on one second.
Okay, I am honored to be here and to be presenting and introducing Laurel Nakadate. Laurel was born in Austin, Texas and raised in Ames, Iowa. She's currently living and working in New York and Boston as faculty at the School of Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University where she earned her BFA. She went on to receive an MFA in photography from Yale University. Her first film, Stay the Same Never Change, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and went on to be featured in New Directors New Films at the Museum of Modern Art and Lincoln Center. Her second feature film, The Wolf Knife, premiered at the Los Angeles Film Festival and was nominated for a Gotham Independent Film Award and an Independent Spirit Award. Her 10-year survey show, Only the Lonely, premiered at MoMA PS1 in 2011 and her photo series, Strangers and Relations, opened the 2015-2016 season at the Des Moines Art Center. Nakadate's most recent projects include the photo series, The Kingdom, which is on view in its entirety for the first time at Tefra ICA, and the critically acclaimed group show, Mother, which she co-curated with Leslie Tonkino Artwork and Projects, and was then expanded into labor, motherhood, and art in collaboration with New Mexico State University. We are very excited to be presenting the third iteration with Laurel and with Dawn at Mason Exhibitions. Her work is in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Yale University Art Gallery, the Hessel Museum of Art at Bard College, LA County Museum of Art, the Guggenheim Museum, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden and other public and private collections in the US and abroad. I think you can see a more full list on Tefra's website. This is actually my second opportunity to be in public conversation with Laurel. You can find our archived conversation also with Marina Iskro, who Janelle mentioned earlier and I think is on this Zoom as well. Hi, Marina. Um, it is archived online under the Smithsonian series Viewfinder, Women's Film and Video from the Smithsonian. Like I said, I'm really thrilled to be partnering with Dawn and Laurel to present these important exhibitions. Through her work, Laurel examines contemporary modes of self-presentation, representation, and identity formation. She explores loneliness and relationships among strangers by making herself available and vulnerable to experiences with others, whether that's her subjects, her collaborators, and or her audience. Her practice really predates yet foreshadows the onslaught of social media platforms that pervade our everyday lives and considers what happens if we use such tools to make genuine connections. What is a genuine connection? Taking this further and through the exhibition, questioning what is a relation? How does that define who you are? These are just some of the primary questions I've been asking as I look at her work and we'll ask some more tonight. I'm now pleased to turn it over to Laurel to have her share her work with all of you. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm gonna go ahead and screen share as well. Also never gets easy. Thank you so much, all of you for coming tonight to this talk. It's so great to see so many familiar faces and names for people have their cameras off. Um, and thank you to Tefra and Janelle and the whole team there for putting on just from what I've seen from installation shots so far, a really beautiful installation. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for this moment, getting to have the show, having this show launch after two years of rescheduling it due to COVID. Um, it was a long time coming and I'm really happy the day has arrived. So thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna jump in and sort of um, start the conversation tonight. Um, around the work that's showing at Tefra. So um, shortly before I began this series, um, I had for one year um, created a performance in which I forced myself to cry every day and made a self portrait of myself, either shortly before, during, or after the act of crying. Um, so for a year, I took pictures of myself. At the end of that performance, I found myself not wanting to 
make pictures of myself anymore. I'm finding myself not wanting to be in front of the camera and wanting to sort of look out at the larger world again. Um, so at that time, I was also thinking a lot about the work of Mike Disfarmer, a photographer in Arkansas in the 1940s who photographed much of a town. Um, I was thinking a lot about this idea, this sort of beautiful idea of strangers coming to you to be seen. Um, and so I decided that I would create a sort of outdoor um, photo studio for myself and I would travel around the country making portraits of strangers. Um, I began inviting strangers to meet me in remote locations at night. This is in Arizona. Um, I would put calls out on either, you know, at the time like MySpace, Facebook, um, any way I could get the sort of word out that I would be somewhere, and then I would invite any invite anyone to join me in that place. So um, here's here are some of those earliest photographs of sort of just meeting strangers at night and standing together and having this sort of moment of seeing one another and standing in these sort of darkened landscapes. Um, I grew up in the Midwest and um, there wasn't much to do in the small town that I grew up in. So one of the things that we would do as teenagers was just go out into the night together and sort of stand in the darkness in cornfields or sitting on top of cars or um, like anywhere that was free as a teenager. So I thought about that a lot when I was working on this project, the idea that people could gather in darkness and have these sort of intimate sort of, you know, human connections for free. Um, I ended up, you know, taking this project on the road when I was um, traveling around for, you know, artist talks or whatever it would be. And I would just like put out a call and say, meet me in this place. And people would do it. And there was this generosity to it, this sort of trust that people would bring their small child in their pajamas and their rain boots and let me photograph them in the middle of the night in Marfa, Texas by the train tracks. There was this beautiful sort of human trust happening in that project. Shortly after, um, I guess it was probably about a year into that project, um, I took a DNA test. And I took a DNA test because my mother um, always believed that there had been a baby that disappeared from our family. Um, nobody really believed her. I think I sort of wanted to believe her, but also didn't want to believe her. Um, and this became the sort of point that my mother just like wouldn't move off of. So she said, let's all take DNA tests and maybe we'll find this baby through DNA tests. Um, we all took DNA tests and I didn't discover a baby um, when we got our results back. But what I did discover was that I had thousands of DNA relatives spread across America. Um, and so I decided in that moment that I would expand my project, which had been photographing strangers at night in remote locations to photographing strangers who were my relatives at night in remote locations. So I went out on the road. Well, first I sent really awkward emails to people. Um, and these emails would say, hi, you don't know me, but according to your DNA test, you are my second cousin, third cousin, fourth cousin, whatever it might be. Um, and I'm an artist and I'm wondering if you would meet me at night in a location of your choice near where you live so that I can photograph you. Um, and I got hundreds of yeses, hundreds of people wrote back saying, sure, I'll meet you. There's a park by my house. I'll see you on, you know, whenever you can make it. And so I traveled for the next five years, I traveled 50,000 miles crisscrossing America making these pictures of these strangers who are also my cousins. Um, so a little bit about how I photographed these people with this sort of very humble light kit. Um, <clears throat> I would travel with a single tripod, a camera, and a flashlight. <clears throat> and each night I would light the picture with only a flashlight and the ambient light of the town or the city around the location in which I was shooting. Um, <clears throat> so you can see sometimes people are squinting because there's this moment where I open the shutter and we have these like long 20 or 30 second exposures in which we're just standing together, trying to be still. Um, and then there's a moment where I paint the figures with a flashlight. And um, that is the moment in which their figures are sort of recorded for the camera against these darkened landscapes. Um, this was in Kentucky. 
Um, I look back now, I didn't have a child when I made this work. And I look back now and I see this person with this tiny, tiny newborn baby. And I am just, I just marvel at the fact that he brought his newborn baby into a cornfield to be photographed. And again, that incredible generosity that the partic participants extended to me is something that a few years later, I just cannot stop thinking about. Um, so I continued on in this way, making these pictures. And I realized at a point, a certain point that it was not just about the people I was photographing. It was about these landscapes, these spaces that I was taking my body to, to sort of retrace the sort of traveling of the DNA that we shared. Everyone in this project shares DNA with me. And so in some ways I saw this project as portraits of these people, but also sort of self-portraits because I share DNA with every single person in this project. Um, people who would show up in bathrobes, people would show up. This woman, I think about this woman a lot actually when I talk about this project because she showed up for the photograph and didn't speak to me. Um, she just um, asked where to stand and I said, this is a good spot. And then I opened the shutter and I painted her with light and I closed the shutter. And then she said, okay, are you done? And I said, yeah, we can be done. Um, but can I just ask you something before you go? Why did you want to participate? I'm so happy you did. Um, but I've been asking people why they chose to participate because it's a really kind of strange project, right? To say yes to a stranger. And she said the thing that I can't stop thinking about, which is she just wanted to be part of something. Um, and I think for me, that was sort of the moment in this project that I realized it had become bigger than I was and that this project, my mother's DNA had brought me to stand in front of these cousins in these you know, random places in America, seemingly random places in America, but my mother's DNA had described and built this whole project for me. Um, and as an artist, I frequently talk about, when I teach, I frequently talk about trusting the process and being okay with not knowing where you're going. And I think that this is the project that I have to keep looking to for myself when I have to remind myself, it's okay to not know where you're going. And it's okay to just trust the work and let the work lead you where it can. And in this, this case, I was trusting my mother's DNA to lead me where it would. So this is on the, um, in Arizona. Um, this is in Ohio. This is in, oh, wow. One of the Carolinas, Carolina Beach. Um, so, you know, it was a really strange sort of stretch of my life really like people would ask me what are you working on and I would describe this to them and um you know like some nights I'd show up and someone would have mini horses and I'd be making these pictures of mini horses in West Palm Beach Florida as the sun sets again and another stranger is standing in front of me and I'm meeting a human being who's related to me um I feel like looking back, I don't know now if I could make this project now necessarily. I think that um, when I began this project, DNA testing was in its sort of earliest phase as far as how uh, consumers, everyday consumers um, approached it. I think that now so many people are testing for reasons other than looking for information or searching. I think that early on, the really early adopters of these, these um, like 23andMe and Ancestry DNA, um, were really searching for something, really the way that my mother was searching for something when she said we should take these DNA tests. Um, and I think because they were searching for something, they were more willing to answer my random email and say yes, because they were curious about what they might find too. It's not that people taking the test now are not curious about themselves, but I don't necessarily know if they're as curious about other people. Um, this is actually my great uncle who I met for the first time through this project. Um, so my, my grandfather's brother, and I never met my grandfather. So the first moment of meeting um, 
his brother was actually an incredible thing. And the fact that this project brought me to him. Um, my grandfather was one of seven brothers and this is the youngest brother. And my grandfather was the oldest brother um, on my mother's side. Um, so sometimes you had, you know, chickens and um, this was an amazing um, night in, oh, wow. This was an amazing night in the middle of winter. I was in a, like driving around in a, you know, car, rental car, um, obviously had not rented the correct car for the project. It was like skidding all over the road, um, you know, got to this sort of incredibly rural spot in Idaho and um, was t escorted in by guards to make this photograph of this person stand this like standing in the darkest darkest night in the whitest snow in the middle of nowhere and I I think I also think about this picture a lot when I think about this project um this is in Kentucky um my on my mother said my mother's mother was a McCoy and so I ended up being related to a lot of McCoys in Kentucky and I went down to Pikeville, Kentucky and photograph this little girl is related to the McCoys. Her mother's a McCoy actually. Um, I think we figured out that she's my, on my mother's side, maybe my fourth cousin. Um, so this project for me sort of defined those five years. Um, it became sort of normal to stand in the middle of nowhere and under darkness with strangers. As it began to end, I think I sort of began to sort of mourn the project, mourn that I wasn't going out and meeting strangers anymore and standing in darkness and learning about their lives. Like this project had become an excuse to reach out to people and to have these conversations that, you know, you wouldn't normally have if you were just in like CVS standing in line, you wouldn't have these like conversations standing in darkness with, with strangers. Um, and I then, realized the project was probably coming to an end. And then I got this email. Um, and it, for those who um, can't see the screen, it says, according to my ancestry DNA results, there's a strong possibility that we are first cousins. Did any of your grandparents live in Odessa, Texas in 1953? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, so we found the baby and um, the baby was my mother's brother's child. Um, so he'd been born, my mom's brother was in high school as was his girlfriend, the birth mother of the baby. Um, and the baby had, they had tried to parent the baby and the baby had lived in my mother's house possibly for a period of time. And that's why my mother remembered the baby. Um, and then the baby had ultimately been raised by extended family on the birth mother's side. So um, there was a baby all along and there still is a baby. And I was actually able to meet the baby um, in real life right before the pandemic started. So um, unfortunately at that time, my mother was really sick um, and was unable to like talk on the phone or anything like that. And I was nine months pregnant. So I couldn't fly to see my mother and tell her this news. Um, <clears throat> so as soon as um, my son was born, I got on a plane and I flew <clears throat> to tell her that we had found the baby. And I told her we found the baby and she died two days later. So after <clears throat> this is actually, this is the catalog of For Strangers and Relations for anyone who's interested in seeing all the work together um, outside of the show. Um, after my mother died and, you know, I was thankful that I was able to give her this information that the baby was real as she had always known. And, you know, in many ways, the baby was the reason I had even taken the DNA test and gone out to do the project. Um, and so, after my mother died, there were many things I kept thinking about. One of the big things I kept thinking about was that because she had died before she could hold my son, um, I had no photographs of my mother holding my son. Um, around that time, I was also getting spam emails from someone trying to offer me Photoshop services. Um, and I'm a photographer, so I don't need someone 
to do Photoshop for me, but they kept sending me these emails that would go into my spam box. And I just started like reading them and they just wanted me to pay them to do Photoshop. And it felt like maybe this is an opportunity for me to collaborate with someone I don't know, another stranger. Um, and maybe they can, oh, and I should back up. The subject of the emails was we can fix anything. Um, and I realized that they couldn't fix the one thing I needed to have fixed, but maybe they could try. And so I began sending them photographs of my mother from throughout her life and photographs of my newborn son. Um, and I gave them one direction, which was place the baby in the woman's arms. Um, and so here you see my mother as a maybe 12 year old um, and my son in her arms. Um, here she is on her wedding day, my mother got married the first time before she married my father and her first marriage, she got married on her 17th birthday. Um, so this is her on her 17th birthday on also her wedding day. Um, here she is. Uh, oh, and the interest, another interesting thing is that frequently the person doing the Photoshop would have to remove another baby to place my son in her arms. So in this case, they had to remove my brother from my mother's arms to place my son there. Um, you can see how terrible the Photoshop is actually, um, but I think that there's something wonderful about the way it fails. The fact that this, this thing I needed fixed could not be fixed. The sort of limitations of what this person could do, the limitations of what technology could do. Um, here she is, you know, in college, um, with a baby on her lap, um, you know, and they're funny and like kind of, kind of absurd, like the scale is all wrong, you know, like the baby's too big in her arms here. Um, it, you know, the baby would not probably be outside without a jacket, the baby's in a hospital blanket, like the, everything's wrong with these, right? But that sort of wrongness is the thing that sort of tugs at, at it, right? Like, and says like, right, it was impossible. She never did hold him. She didn't get to raise him with me. She didn't get to watch him grow up. And the sort of failure of the Photoshop reminds us of that. Um, in this picture, they had to remove me as a baby from the baby backpack to put him there. Um, again, like, you know, the baby would never be at the beach. Um, and so you see, oh, this one too, like this one, they thinned my mother's arm. Like I never asked them to thin my mother's arm, but like that sort of the way that this Photoshop technician decided to fix anything was like not the, still not the thing I need fixed and still not fixed. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and you sort of see her in her life, right? Like you see a woman's life in snapshots, you see, her in this weird edge of a river, you know, you see her hiking. And it's like, in a way, I think you begin to learn something about my mother's life, or at least my mother's life in snapshots. Um, in this one, they put my son in my mother's mother's arms, my grandmother's arms. Um, and I've always sort of, when I first got it back, I was like, oh, they put the baby in the wrong woman's arms. And then I realized like maybe from the great beyond, my grandmother was like, I'll hold that baby. Um, and so again, like these accidents, these sort of accidents of this project that sort of have spoken to me in different ways. Um, so my brother doesn't probably want to be in this project <laughs> with his 1980s and 90s teenage outfits. Um, so This one's great. She was actually holding a cat that had to be removed for this one. Um, so it's funny. I have a, a relationship with this work. I think that sort of ebbs and flows. Sometimes I feel like it's just very funny. Sometimes I feel sort of devastated when I look at it because even though it's ridiculous and the pictures fail and it, it doesn't work, there's this moment when I look at these pictures and I think, I wish they were real. I wish that these existed. Um, you know, I wish that these could be in real life. Someone asked me once, do you ever look at them and forget? And the answer is, um, 
Yes, actually this one, one time I looked at this and I was like, oh, that's us together. And then like for a beat, I just forgot that I don't have a single photograph of me with my mother and my kid at all. And this is the only photograph I have of my mother with me and my son. Um, I say that these sort of feel like they live in that space between sleeping and waking and when you forget for a moment the terrible thing has happened. And so I can sort of live in this space where these pictures are real until I open my eyes and then they're not. Um, when this one, you know, I sent these pictures to be photoshopped together and the technician wrote to me and said, I'm so sorry, but this one is impossible. It will be too hard. And I said, please just try, I'll accept any outcome. And then they sent this and I was like, this one actually almost looks real. <laughs> this one actually almost looks like it is not fake. Um, but also that word fake is interesting, right? Because they are pictures of my son and my mother's arms, right? They are pictures of him in her arms. So are they fake? Or are they just photographs of my son and my mother's arms? So something else I think about. So again, you see her age, you see her sort of enter the end of her life. Um, this is one of the last photographs I ever made of my mother. Um, and this is among the first photographs of my son. And, Something I think about a lot is that the person who did the Photoshop photoshopped their hands together. Um, and so they're holding hands. And this was, if not the last, among the last pictures I asked for them to put together. And I think that it's possible the person who was making, who's doing the Photoshop understood in the end what I wanted, that they had traveled with me through 34 snapshots being put together, I guess, actually double that, put together. And they had sort of lived through these requests over a period of time so that they, I think it's possible they understood what I wanted, that it wasn't just about put them together. It was like literally have them live together. So um, be in the space together over time in snapshots, like have a life on camera that they couldn't have. So um, I think that that is where I'm going to end. Um, I'll stop sharing. Are you, okay, I think, Am I back? Can you see? Okay, you're good. Okay. Um, that was great. Okay, really so yeah, great. so that's, I think I'll end there. Um, I know I'll be giving a longer talk on a sort of 20 years of my work and not 10 years of my work um, at George Mason. So yeah. Thank you. Um, I want, I, I want to let Dawn come in and <laughs> ask some questions. But before we get there, um, I think we should talk about why all of the photographs of relations are your mother's DNA connections and how we got to this idea of the mother line and the mother exhibition um, and how that really seems like it makes sense really following the full 20 year trajectory of your work and your family history. But I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. About why, so first why it was only my mother's side. So my father also took a DNA test. Um, my dad is Japanese American and at the time, so this would have been whatever, 2011 when we took these tests, um, he only had 12 matches and my mother had around 1200 matches. So. Um, there was that challenge. Um, I did send letters to all of his matches and one person did write me back um, and he said he would participate, but he lived in Japan. And so that I would still like to photograph him at some point, but I haven't been to Japan since I shot this project. So I just haven't, I did meet him on Zoom though. Um, so that was the reason why initially the project was only my mother's DNA. Um, but 
once I realized that I just didn't have anyone responding to me from my father's side, I realized there was something really powerful about this being the maternal line. I realized that I was able to use my mother's DNA to track back and find relatives whose surnames had been lost to the family tree as just being the mother and losing the last name. And so this was a tool to find strangers who might've even fallen off the family trees. I really, uh, really responded to sort of the sense of wonder that you have, you know, about, about your family and how in the end, it's almost like a lucid dream, you know, like you have this idea and then all of a sudden you're actually materializing um, something that is, you know, until recently, like not accessible information or it would be very difficult to, to come by. Um, so yeah, I certainly find that fascinating. And the filmic sense that all the work has, the montage, the, um, um, I would, do you view this as really, as an extension of your film work or what is the relation between, you're obviously multidisciplinary, but yeah. you know, you're just one person with these great ideas and it's coming out in all these different ways. Um, I think that frequently I'll have an idea and I'll try to consider very carefully what the form should be, what form it should find. And that sort of determines how I make it. Um, you know, I've made two feature films and both of them were shot with either one or two cameras, a lot of handheld and all available light. Um, and I think, you know, I used to always say, I make feature films like a photographer, right. <laughs> like an artist would, like just walking around with a camera, telling a story either through constructed narratives or found narratives combined together to tell the story I'm trying to form. Um, and so in some ways, it's, it's interesting that you said like a lucid dream. In some ways, I feel like it is, right? Like you sort of choose the story you want to tell, find the form in which to tell it and begin. Um, and that beginning is like the opening of the dream. And I, you know, I, I don't know, I like that. I think I'll be thinking about that. But I, um, I think that I often have, it all kind of comes together at once. Like the strangers and relations, you know, it started out as star portraits before it was the DNA relatives. That came to me just sort of in a moment. I was out in Arizona with my husband and um, I wanted to take his picture, but it was night and all I had was a flashlight. And so I decided, I'm just gonna light up the flashlight. You know, I, at that point I shot these like two feature films using all available light. When you don't have a budget to make things, you have to get really creative. Um, limitations. So exactly, like the limitations force the creativity. And, you know, on those feature films, I would frequently have like random lights, like duct taped places, like trying to just fill in a little bit of something because we were really just trying to use available light and not set up any, like, we didn't have like permission to shoot anywhere. Well, that was the other thing. And if you don't have permission to shoot anywhere, everything has to be kind of like handheld and movable. You can't put down tripods. Um, that's like one of the big distinctions I make when you're out shooting is it's one price. It's, it's free if you can do it quickly, right? But if you need to like put down tripods, it immediately becomes a more expensive project because you have to have permits. Um, and so that's why so much was handheld because we just didn't have the budget to put down tripods. Um, but with the, the project, so I was out in Arizona, I was trying to shoot this picture of my husband and I realized the only light I had was a flashlight. And so I made his portrait with a flashlight and I realized this is something, there's something here. Um, and then I you know, invited some friends to photograph and I realized there was really something here. And that's when I was off doing strangers, or sorry, um, star portraits. So it just sort of came together in that way. Um, and then with the kingdom, you know, so th this, the reason it's called the kingdom is that when my mother was really sick and I was very pregnant and I couldn't, I just legally couldn't fly. I was so pregnant and she was dying. And so the only way we could have a relationship at the end of her life was that my brother would go to the hospital and open up FaceTime and we would FaceTime each other. And um, she, 
you know, when my son was born, she was still able to wake up. Um, and so she, she couldn't speak very much, but she could wake up and she looked at my son, my newborn son, who was like three days old with me holding him, like desperately trying to get his face in front of like the iPhone. And, um, she looked at him and then my brother had brought his daughter and she was two at the time or one and a half. And she was, Nora was sitting on my mom's lap and she looked at my son and she looked at Nora and she said, the kingdom. And that was the last thing she ever said to me. And so that's, that's why I called that piece of wow. kingdom, which is like heartbreaking and amazing. And like, what is the kingdom? What does it mean? Like, what did it mean to her? I don't know. I think I know, but um, you know, that's why I called that piece, the kingdom, because it felt like, you know, and now we have everything and nothing. Yeah. It's very fulfilling. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if I'm answering any of your questions. No, no, no. Yeah. This is great. Um, another thing that I was thinking about um, in the, in the text, it talks about your prescience about social media and all that. Um, obviously the democratization of digital culture, you know, it's quite amazing. It's also kind of horrifying most of the time now. Um, but people are more and more presenting themselves, you know, as YouTubers or streamers or IRL streamers <laughs> or whatever. Um, and the, the presentation of the self, you know, um, mm -hmm. is, is greatly democratizing. At this at this moment in time, and I don't really have a question. I just think it's really interesting, um, you know, that your work was talking about these things sort of in advance, as often artists do. Yeah, you know, I was thinking the other day that nobody has said to me in so long now, "Why do you make all this work about yourself?" Like nobody has said that to me in so <laughs> long because everything now is about oneself. Like right. you're not making, you know, all of the influencers and all the whatever, but what we know is that it's not about them, right? Like what we know is that those are constructed lives for the camera. Right. They're performing right. for the camera, right? Their whole life is about performing for the camera, like this persona, right. but under the guise of being open and generous with, you know, but but they're not really, right? Because they're performing for the camera. Right. They're performing for products or whatever it is, which is its own interesting conversation to follow. But sure. um, early on, you know, like all of my work was about making these connections with strangers, like performing these, you know, constructed lives on camera. Um, it was about me being in the work and people would just constantly say like, why are you in your own work? Why are you in front of the camera? You know, mm. and now we wouldn't even think of it because we're so bludgeoned by the internet that it is expected that one has a selfie light, you know, like that's expected yeah. and okay now. So a ring light. Yeah. Where's your ring light? <laughs> yeah. Selfie <laughs> ring light. Yeah. Um, this is something I think we've talked about a little bit, Laurel, and this idea of vulnerability and the private and the public and how, you know, and talking about your early work and people asking you about why you were always making work about yourself. There is something about your performance, though, that still allows a recognition of your vulnerability and the way that you are putting yourself out there, maybe to gain the trust of your collaborators, your subjects, um, and thinking about how that's just different in the world of social media. People really are not being vulnerable. It's purely constructed in a way to hide vulnerability. And thinking about, um, you know, even as you were talking about using the flashlight to take these portraits at night, thinking about the inspection that one might feel standing in front of you as you're shining a light on them and you get to decide what you're focusing on beyond just the camera, but also that you are bringing yourself to that location totally alone, <laughs> offering your person to them as well, and just how that creates this different relationship than being alone in a room performing for millions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just a thought and really recognizing your openness in these projects and looking at the comments in the chat and thinking about how I think so many people can relate to the work that you're doing because 
you allow them to by saying it's okay to be vulnerable as well because you are. Yeah, I think that throughout my time of making work, um, I frequently just sort of decided I have to make this thing now and I will make it. And I will hope that other people will understand why I made it and that that recognition will be part of why the work had to be made. Um, and so I don't think I've ever really thought of it as generous. I, I mean, I, I'm happy that you're saying that it's generous. Um, I think that my desire to tell the stories was my, the driving force to do the thing, to make the work, um, to, want it, to want to see what would happen, right? Like as a photographer, to simply want to see what it would look like, like just to want to see what it would look like. Um, and certainly with my earliest work, when I would like go out into the middle of nowhere and find strangers to tell stories with on camera, um, that was about wanting to be in a space with a person I didn't know and tell a story together because I might learn something I didn't know. And I might be able to describe something about my own life that others might recognize in themselves or might identify with or might um, feel empowered to react to in some way. So That's generous. Yeah, maybe it's generous. Yeah. But I think there was also this sort of deep desire to tell a story for me that um, I guess if the end result was generosity, then that's good, yeah. Is there an opportunity for the, uh, the assembled peoples to talk as well? Yeah, I can't even keep up with the, the chat. I, I feel like I oh, wanna go goodness. through it. Maybe, yeah. and people should feel welcome to ask questions or sit, make, you know, whatever. I don't know if that allowed. Janelle, is that allowed? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'll go ahead and read a few of the comments in the chat. And then if anyone wants to raise their hand to sort of unmute themselves and turn their camera on, you can do that as well. This has been a fantastic chat so far. Um, I'm excited to hear from the audience. So Jennifer Brewer Stone um, made a comment. She says she really identifies with this work. Her grandmother, her grandmother, and her grandmother died when her mother was 16 and she never got a chance to meet her. And she's about to give birth herself. So she said it's something her family, her mother thinks about a lot lately. Her husband's grandmother also died. Um, so she's these connections with strangers and strangers that are actually family, she's very much interested in at the moment. Um, Thank you for saying that. You know, it's it's interesting that not interesting, it's devastating. Um, how many people have written to me saying that they have had similar situations or similar circumstances in which their child didn't get to meet their parents, you know? Um, and I think that when I set out to make the work, I didn't set out to make the work thinking that I, that I would have those conversations with people. But um, once again, my work has allowed me to have conversations with strangers because the work was made. And so it sort of continues. Um, yeah. Thank you. And Peter Winant that Lily mentioned earlier is one of our TEFRA ICA board members and who apparently was the spark of all of this happening. Hi, Peter. He says to Laurel, first, thank you. I want to ask about the relationship of luck and intention. Your photos are centered. You paint slash inform your subjects with light. The subjects show up as they are, and your invitation is as big as is a big maybe as to whether anyone would show up. In the kingdom, your works give already existing photos and let someone else take control. Both are interesting propositions. What about the equation of luck and control? I feel like all of it's about luck in a way, right? Like, will it rain that night? Will it, there's that photograph of that woman in Ohio and she's holding an umbrella. And as I arrived at, as I landed at the airport and realized I was about to have an entire night of shooting in the rain and I had two shoots that night. Um, at first I was really upset because I was like, I just flew to Ohio to shoot in a rainstorm. <laughs> um, 
and I like went to, you know, the store and got an umbrella. Cause I was like, I'm going to have to like hold an umbrella over my camera. And the person I'm photographing is probably going to want an umbrella. I don't know if they have one. I'm going to have to get one, but I felt really at that moment, I felt like it was not very lucky that I had to deal with the circumstances, but that picture is incredible actually. And that picture is one of the strongest images made that year. And I, uh, for me, and I, feel really strongly that the sort of unlucky thing of the rain that night became really lucky. Um, and maybe part of it is just deciding to make it lucky, like deciding, okay, now this is a picture of a person with an umbrella at night. And guess what? It totally worked. And the reason it worked is that the umbrella acted like um, this sort of dome around the back of her and it allowed the light to illuminate her face and her glasses in a way that I would not have been able to do had I not had that umbrella and it was this moment of just saying I will build this thing that's been put in front of me and I'll just accept it so um I think so much of it is about luck but I think that luck depends on saying yes right I could have just canceled the shoot. I could have said, it's raining. I'm just going to like hang out in a hotel for a night. I'll see you tomorrow night. Is that okay? But I just decided I was just going to do it. I was just going to do the shoot. And so, yeah, I don't know. It seems to me that you're very, very intentional about what you're doing, <laughs> even though you have no idea what it's going to actually be. And then you said the word accept what happens, you know, yeah, as really just being part of the process. I mean, that's the richness of the work for me is, is all that stuff is only guided by your something in your head, you know, an intent. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing about being a photographer is that the real world is more amazing than we could possibly imagine, right? And so trusting the world, going out in the world and trusting that the world will be amazing, but being open to the possibility of it being amazing is step one of being right. a photographer, right? Like I always talk about this with my students, this idea that if you just don't go outside and with your camera and try, nothing will happen, right? Um, and the best camera is the one in your hand. So right. go out with your camera and make pictures. And it, it's, Sometimes I have to remind myself, right? Like go out and do the work, just do the work. Um, it sounds so simple, right? It sounds so simple, like go out, let the world surprise you. But it's actually this incredibly like time tested thing, right? Like go out and just let the world happen in front of you. Um, so I don't know if it answers the question about luck, but yeah. Thank you, Laurel. Um, another question, Melanie Kihos says, Laurel, did you develop relationships with any of your newfound relatives? And if not, did that matter? I did, yeah, a handful of them are still, we're still um, friends now, or, you know, like Facebook friends or Instagram friends or like text each other on birthdays or like, you know, when more people are born in their family, I like send a card, you know, so it's, one of these things where some of them, yeah, I'm still friends with some of them I never saw again after that night. Um, but I don't like, I don't really think that when I went into it, I was thinking I would keep up relationships with everyone. What was more important to me was that I would have this experience with them, like this moment together. Um, and then if it naturally developed into something bigger or longer lasting, like that is great. Um, I'm actually surprised at how many I am still in touch with. Um, I think that the combination of being related, standing together at night, and then having this document of this meeting, those sort of three things work together to create actual lasting relationships with some of them. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Joe Bios asks or says, the evolution of your work is fascinating, thrilling. The earlier work is flush with under the surface danger risk. How would you account for your own artistic art? Arc. <laughs> um, it's funny. I feel like in a way, all the work is about the same thing. You know, it's about um, having a body, being in the world, going out into the world, interacting with people, 
who tell you stories or teach you things about yourself or your relationship with yourself or them. And then it's described in some way on camera. <laughs> I feel like it's sort of, that's sort of, all, it's all the same thing. Um, I think in my earliest work, you know, I went out and I'll talk about this more at the Mason talk. Um, but in my earliest work, I went out to try to speak about my great grandmothers. My great grandmothers were picture brides. They were brought from Japan to America um, in the early 1900s. And they married men they didn't know and lived in a country they'd never been to. They didn't want them. Um, and I wanted to go out and describe those relationships. And so I used myself, my body to go out into the world to meet people I didn't know and to describe relationships on camera. And so without my great grandmothers and learning about their lives as picture brides in this country, I never would have gone out to try to make this work with strangers. And in some ways, I think that all of my work in some way is in debt to, indebted to those great grandmothers, trying to try on their lives, trying to think about what it would mean to marry a man you've never met and live in a country you've never been to, trusting, just completely trusting that this is going to work out. Um, and of course, it, it, in some ways, it, in many ways, it didn't work out. Um, they were interned, their, their children were interned by the US government in concentration camps during the war. They were um, denied citizenship. They weren't allowed to go to certain colleges and universities. Um, but then here I am, right? Like I am the great hope that these women maybe hoped for when they came to this country. And so I don't know if, I, I, I think I wouldn't have made that work. I don't think I ever would have made that work. And I don't think I would have, been the artist that I am, the type of artist that I am, the, the type of artist that questions my own relationship and identity with, within the lives of strangers. Because when you grow up with that narrative, like kind of always in the background, or you grow up always sort of thinking about your own identity and relationship with other people, it forms like a very specific way of being and looking at the world, always feeling like other in some way or always feeling like you don't quite fit creates a position to stand in in which you can observe the world and begin to tell your story because you don't really feel like you fit in the big story. And so I don't know. I don't know if that answers anything either, but I think that I look back now, the sort of arc of my life, my career life or my life in art, and I think I owe everything to them, actually. I think that um I don't think I realized it at 21 or whatever I was when I started making that work, but I realize it now. I think now I wouldn't have delved so deeply into my own identity or the identity of, that I created on camera that bumped up against the lives of other people if I hadn't been thinking about their lives, you know, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lee Davis says, Laurel, thank you for sharing. I love hearing more about your process. As someone who used to travel to make images of my subjects, also DIY and of many strangers before becoming a mother, I'm curious about how becoming a parent has shifted the way you encounter your work. Has this shifted for you? Do you still wish to travel solo? And how has the process shifted? Also, COVID is definitely a factor. Yeah. Um... So before COVID happened, I was um, about a year into shooting a documentary feature film um, that I hope to finish. I might just find a different way to finish it. I don't know, I don't know how I'm gonna finish it at this point. I know I will. So when I say I don't know how, it's just the more that I don't know how I will finish it, but I will. Um, but I just put my, my son in a baby backpack and I went and shot my film. Um, you can hear him talking in the background of a lot of my shots. Um, it's a documentary about my mother's life. It's it sort of, you know, at, after I finished Strangers in Relations and in the Kingdom, um, first I thought or hoped that I was sort of done with the material and that, you know, I had made this work, the Kingdom project in the wake of her death. And I thought, well, like, now I'm just gonna go make something else, but I couldn't stop thinking about her life. And then I started sort of scratching the surface of my great grandmother's life, who I, my middle name comes from her. And I 
found out some really thrilling and strange and bizarre information about her life. And so I, um, while I was doing that, I had started going to every house my mother ever lived in. I wrote a letter to every single house my mother ever lived in. It was like many dozens of homes. Um, and I started going out and interviewing the people in these homes. And so it was this portrait of my mother, of this house, of the people living there now, of a neighborhood, of um, America, of all of these things, these people and all of these, these places. And while I was doing that COVID hit. And so um, I think I will finish it. I hope I will finish it. I don't know if I'll finish it in exactly the same way. I don't know that it needs to now because in a way this project that I started before COVID can never be, right? Like that project now I've realized can never be in the exact same way. Um, it will have to address the fact that it half was shot before COVID and half will be shot in whatever the world is when I can go back out to shoot again. Um, but yeah, in some of the shots, you hear a baby on my back saying, I want a snack, <laughs> you know, um, but it's okay, I think, because the material is about my mother and it's about my family. And I think it's okay for an artist to be a mother and have their child on their back, you know, and if that's the way the work has to get made, then that's the way the work has to get made. And I think that also, you know, people who are parents who make art need to, or should, maybe we should all just agree that it's it's okay to be visible like it's okay to parent in public as an artist like it's okay to say this really important person in my life is on my back right now and it's okay like we're all okay with that um and that's part of why you know I wanted to make the mother show I, um you know when I first asked Leslie if we could do this show um you know I think it was a real risk it's for so long in the art world. And even now, I think in the art world, like um, you're not really allowed to talk about your children or to have children. And it sort of enraged me. And I think that part of what happened after my mother died is I was in that sort of free fall people are in when you lose a parent and you're just sort of so lost in it that you remove all boundaries. And so I was in this sort of free fall where I was like, my mother's dead. I just had a child. I have no witness to what's happening in my life right now. So I'm gonna co-curate a show on mothers in the art world, you know? Um, and it was a really weird choice. And um, it sounds funny now because even since 2018 to now, I feel like there's so much more support, so much more support since 2018 even. And that's not that many years ago. But I think when we launched that show, it was a real risk, like to say, I'm going to make, you know, and I'm going to make a, a show in which we talk about mothers and motherhood. Like, so um, I'm glad now that it doesn't really feel as risky. Like as we approach the third version of the show, um, now it kind of feels like a celebration. I'm not as scared to show that work. Like I feel really just excited about it. Um, but when Leslie and I launched the first version in 2018, I was like, this could be, this could go really badly, you know? Um, but it didn't, you know, it didn't. And um, I think that maybe one of the jobs of, that we have right now is people with children, like do it, do it in front of other people. Because if we all are upfront about it, <laughs> like power in numbers, you know? So. I think I just want to add that one of the strongest things about the mother show to me and one of the reasons I'm really excited we're going to keep working on it is that you really show a perspective that is unexpected it's not about the early days of motherhood it's not just about the labor of raising a child but it is different perspectives of mothers from their children or um, perspectives of children from the mothers and it is not all uh, it is all beautiful but it's not all you know the rosy okay. performance yeah. of motherhood yeah. it is the yeah. reality of the messiness of mothers and our relationships with them yeah and how there's so many different ways to be a mother 
yeah. or to have a mother, you know? Exactly. Um, and I feel like we've only scratched the surface with the show in a way, you know, like really we need like 10 museum spaces to tell that story. Um, the other thing I realized is that when Leslie and I first started, you know, thinking about artists, there's so many artists who have made work about their mothers, so many, right? I mean, and it makes sense, right? It totally makes sense. Um, I try to propose, you know, I teach. And so I try to propose a class on mothers, work about mothers for, for years now. I've tried to propose that class at different institutions and no one would let me teach it because they all said they didn't think students would be interested enough in the subject. Um, Tufts University let me teach it last spring um, and it filled in one hour. So, and I'm teaching it again this spring and it filled in 30 minutes. So this class is a class that students want to take and they want to learn about work about mothers. And just because they're teenagers doesn't mean that they're not interested in that relationship. And, you know, they might be entering it thinking about their own mothers or, you know, obviously they're probably not as often thinking about it from the perspective of being a mother, though there, there are students who are thinking about it from that perspective. Um, but I just think it's one of those things where the second we started saying, just like normalizing it, saying, oh no, we're going to have a conversation about mothers and motherhood now. People are there for it. The audience has always been there for it. It's just that there were barriers because people were, they felt scared and vulnerable to reveal that they were interested in that conversation. But everybody's actually interested in that conversation, you know. Well, and so. if you look back at the history of Western art that we're taught in our Art History Survey 101, the first images we see are of mothers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, well, I'm very, I'm excited that we're doing the show again. So, yeah. yeah me too. And for those that may have joined us late, uh, Laura and Lily were just talking about the mother exhibition, which will be on view at George Mason's Mason Arlington space, um, March 25th. It's concurrent with this show. It looks like we have one last question before we begin to wrap up for the evening. And that is from John Ye and Robert Tamaru. And they say, there's such a big difference in exposure between the background and the people. Did you bracket the shots to try to get the optimum exposure or did you manipulate the image after initial creation? So there's no manipulation act after the creation other than like printing it and like, like, like um, making a photographic print, but that's not, I wouldn't consider that manipulation. Um, when I made the photographs, I would do a series of light tests, you know, as the sun was setting, I couldn't shoot the pictures until it was so dark that we couldn't see one another because if it was too light, the backgrounds would be just way too light when it was dark enough to describe the person with the flashlight. So for photographers out there, I would open the shutter. It would be like 15 to 30 seconds exposure. In that moment, I would quickly use a flashlight to light the subject. And then I would close the shutter. Um, depending on how much light pollution there was, uh, the shot would be shorter. Like if I was outside of like San Francisco, there was just so much light pollution, the exposure is going to be like 10 seconds. Um, I got to the point where I didn't need to do as many tests. I can really, even now I could stand outside and tell you how many seconds I need to describe the sky the way I want to describe it. Um, early on, I was having to do these little tests. Like actually the first shot the first person I shot in this project was a man outside of Des Moines, Iowa. Um, and he was one of the first people to write to me and say yes, that he would participate. And what's interesting about that is that I grew up in Iowa. And so I thought that that was the sort of sign that one of the first participants was gonna be in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, my mother was living in Iowa at the time. And so my mom went with me to the first shoot. I took my mom with me to this first shoot and I hadn't really totally figured out how to make these exposures yet because I just wasn't very, I was zero far into the project. Um, and so I, I look back and sort of cringe at how many tests I had to do that night um, with my mother standing there with me. Um, but I'm so happy for it now. You know, I'm so happy for having had that experience of like bumbling around in the darkness, trying to like make this thing work. Um, so I guess to answer your question, I did everything in camera. There's no manipulation outside of what happened that night 
other than making really nice prints later. Yeah. That's incredible. Uh, one last question, because this is the chair of our board of directors at TEFRA. Robert Gowdy says, the femininity and feminism in your work is, of course, a tremendous source. Yet the work, the kingdom, arguably invokes a certain masculinity. You said you think you know what your mom went, meant when invoking that word. Do you care to elaborate on that? I don't know. You know, I really, I don't know what she meant. What I think what I wanted it to mean is that she was looking at her grandchildren and that's all she needed. That she recognized my son as being part of her kingdom or part of what she imagined to be a kingdom. I think that's what my heart wants it to be. Like I want it to be that she recognized my child because she was so sick at that point that, you know, she was FaceTiming with me, but I didn't know if she was really recognizing, you know, what was going on. And when she said that, I, I feel like, or maybe my heart wants to believe that like she saw him and she recognized him as being, making our family whole, you know? Um, so I don't know, I'll never know. I don't, I mean, I might know, but, but I don't know that any of us can really know really. And maybe that's what's beautiful about it, right? Like maybe the kingdom is what any of us wants it to be for in that project and that we will all enter it from different spaces depending on our own relationship with children and mothers and loss and photography and time and snapshots and you know 1943 to 2016 like we'll all have different relationships with perm hair in the 80s like i don't know you know but um that's okay like we can all find our own entrance into the kingdom i think and our kingdom can be whatever we need it to be at, at that time and that day. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, Laurel, Lily, Don, is there anything you want to leave the audience with before I say closing remarks? You go ahead. I think just thank you so much for having me. And um, I really hope I can come see the show in person before it closes. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you to George Mason and Tefra, and of course to Laurel. And please come see the show. The photographs are absolutely gorgeous and you need to stand in front of them to really take it all in and come see the show at Mason at the end of March. And I hope to see you all on other programs. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everyone. Again, the Motherline show is on view until May 2022. Laurel, thank you for sharing your work with us. I always love hearing you speak. You're an incredible storyteller. Lily Don, thank you for bringing the opportunity to our community to experience and connect with Laurel and her practice and in this region. As Lily just mentioned, uh, be sure to keep an eye out for the opening of concurrent exhibition Mother, which will be on view at Mason's exhibition in Arlington, beginning on March 25th, and their upcoming Visual Voices program, which will feature Laurel on February 24th, and Tefer ICA's upcoming pro program with Hershorn curator Marina Isbro. Please stay connected with us on social media at Tefer ICA and sign up for our newsletter to stay updated on all things Tefra. Thank you, everyone. Good night.